Welcome to the Warren Auditorium at the University of San Diego, and welcome to Restoring Humanity, a speaker showcase on restorative reintegration. Please help me welcome to the stage Director of the Office for Life, Peace, and Justice for the Diocese of San Diego, Bobby Enow. Welcome. My name is Bobby Eno, and I'm the director for the Office for Life, Peace, and Justice at the Diocese of San Diego. And along with Amplify Voices and the University of San Diego's Center for Restorative Justice, we're sponsoring this event this afternoon. Welcome also to the many folks here that are live streaming in to see this event. Today, you're going to hear the courageous stories from six individuals that have been formerly incarcerated or impacted by the criminal justice system. We welcome you all. And we ask that as we go into this wonderful experience, that you keep your hearts open and your minds open as you hear these incredible stories, the incredible life stories. We're very blessed today that we have our auxiliary bishop for the Diocese of San Diego, Bishop Ramon Bajarano, that's going to provide us with an opening prayer and blessing. Bishop Ramon was consecrated a bishop in 2020 here in the Diocese of San Diego. And before that, he was ordained a priest in 1998 where he was a pastor and had other priestly assignments in the Diocese of Stockton in Central California. So I'd like to welcome Bishop Ramon. I would like to invite everyone to enter into a spirit of prayer at this moment. God of goodness and compassion, who gives the gift of life. I thank you for all the good things we receive. As we gather here today, I recognize that there, there are sisters and brothers who need to be restored to their dignity and life. As we hear today there, these voices, open our minds and hearts so that with profound understanding empathize with their stories and feelings. Help us embrace their struggles and hopes. You teach us to build bridges amongst us through dialogue and reconciliation. Teach us how to restore to justice what has been broken, the different lives that are affected by our human limitations and mistakes. Victims and victimizers need our support and love. You are a God of opportunities who never grows tired of giving mercy. I pray for the incarcerated and their families. I pray for healing and peace for victims. I pray for everyone who are living a new opportunity in life. I pray for safety in our prisons and for justice systems that learn from your mercy. I pray for all of us gathered here and help us to be grateful for the freedoms we enjoy and never abuse of those freedoms. I ask this through Christ, our Lord. Amen. Thank you for being here today. Uh, my name is Ramon Bejarano and it's a great blessing to be here with all of you. I've been a priest for 23 years. Well, now uh, two years here in San Diego as auxiliary bishop. But as a seminarian, I already had the experience to visit uh, the prisons uh, as a ministry. And it was always a very painful experience every time you heard those metal doors closing. For some reason, it kind of affected your way of thinking, your feelings at that moment. Now, as Christians, or whatever our, our faith is, I want to share, at least from the Christian perspective, that when Jesus says that when I was in prison and you visited me, I believe that he is teaching us to see the person, the child of God created in his own image and likeness, who need to experience mercy, forgiveness, and the opportunity to restore the wrong 
that she or he has done. This is what Catholics precisely do when we go to the sacrament of reconciliation, when we receive the penance. Penance is not a punishment for the sins that I have committed, but penance is an opportunity to restore the good that I failed to do or the wrong that I committed. So I have always admired how loving and merciful God is for all of us, but especially through the teachings that Jesus gives us, that parable of the king who forgets the whole debt to one of the servants. And when that servant failed to do the same, the king tells him, should you have not done the same thing with your fellow servant as I did to you? So Pope Francis has been telling us lately that we need windows in our prisons and they are not to escape. But he says that these windows are windows of hope. A window where the light of freedom can bring a prisoner back to his senses and be able to begin the journey back home, like the parable of the prodigal son and his merciful father. So I hope that today these testimonies that we are going to hear encourage all of us to see that windows of hope work and make the difference in the life our, our brothers and sisters. And I hope also that we'll continue to strengthen our efforts to live the gift of restorative justice in all the aspects of our lives, not only for prisoners, but for everything we do, especially our interactions that we have with our sisters and brothers. So it's a blessing to be here with all of you. Welcome. Please help me welcome to the stage the director of the Center for Restorative Justice at the University of San Diego, David Karp. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm going to read this so I can be super brief. Um, on behalf of the Center for Restorative Justice here at the University of San Diego, I'd like to welcome you to today's event, Restoring Huma uh, Humanity. If you're here in the auditorium, uh, you know just how beautiful our campus is. Uh, but I'd like to remind us that this uh, really majestic place is colonized property and actually Kumeyaay land. In restorative justice, we often talk about the first harm of our country, which is that this land was taken without consent. Yet here we stand in the most tribally diverse region of our country, Kumeyaay and many other tribes. I'd like us to remember this first harm and appreciate its full implications. We gather in this place today at a particularly fractured time. Here in California, we are in a severe drought and just 15 miles from the Mexican border constantly reminded about how this country decides who belongs and who does not. We're reeling from multiple mass shootings, still in a global pandemic, horrified by the war in Ukraine, and trapped in a downward spiral of corrosive political polarization. In response to all of these crises, what we offer today is restorative justice which fully embraces a fundamental teaching of the indigenous peoples of America, that we must find harmony in all of our relations with the people around us and with our environment. That's the overarching theme of today. I'm grateful that we have a group of distinguished speakers to share with us their wisdom about how we can restore our humanity. Thank you. Please help me welcome to the screen Assistant Professor from the School of Public Affairs at San Diego State University, Kim Cross. When people think about justice in response to crime, they often think prison is it. 
If you send someone to prison for committing a crime, you've solved the problem. The problem of the offense, satisfying the victims and communities need for justice. People think less often about if prison is actually achieving its goal of justice or what justice looks like. Restorative justice is a process and philosophy about responding to harm, not just to crime. When you think about responding to the harm caused, you include the possibility of promoting healing to the victim, rebuilding trust amongst a community that feels violated by the harm, but you're also offering healing to the person who committed the harm through accountability and empowerment to change their lives. In this way, restorative justice holds the power to restore humanity to those who've harmed, been harmed, and to the community. But not everyone feels comfortable with this idea. Why should we care about restoring the person who's engaged in crime? Doesn't that let people off easy? Doesn't it show the victim and community that we don't care about them as much as we care about the people who engaged in crime? I used to ask these questions when I began my career as a parole officer. Since my job was to monitor people after they returned home from prison and refer them to services they might need, I wasn't supposed to be in the business of worrying about whether people felt like humans. It seemed to me that they would get there only if they were the perfect parolees. By then, surely they were restored, whatever that meant. But I also felt uncomfortable with the idea that people I was working with were being treated as something other than human. Sure, the goal of, the, of parole was to support people in being productive members of society, but my job felt more like I was waiting for people to mess up and I was helping people work toward a good life. In fact, 25% of people who are in prison are there for a parole technical violation, for messing up, like being homeless or relapsing into substance misuse, not for a new crime. The idea of messing up ignored the messiness of people's lives and gave little thought to the worlds they lived in, their experiences in prison, or their lives before they became involved in the justice system. Still, when it came to restorative justice as a possible solution, I was a non-believer. I just can't see how focusing on restoring people's lives would help victims receive justice, people on parole be deterred from committing more crime. Even when I transitioned from being a parole officer to studying for my doctorate in criminology, I was skeptical that focusing on restorative justice would achieve what I thought was supposed to be the primary goal of the justice system, which was to not have people reoffend. But as I studied, the conundrum was that I really cared about the lives of the people who'd been involved in the system. After seeing so many people while in jail and at very low points in their lives, then back in front of a judge hoping for another chance, it was clear that the current system was adequate to help that chance be successful. I believe there was something that could be discovered to help people move away from a life of crime. I've built a body of research focused on the lives of men and women returning from prison, especially the barriers, collateral consequences, and stigma they face. In one study I conducted following men and women for three years after being released from prison, I found that despite attaining stable housing, employment, and completing parole, their lives were still in turmoil with unresolved trauma, lack of mental health care, and financial instability. Many still hadn't reunited with family or rebuilt relationships with people in their communities because of the stigma and trauma of incarceration. It was through this work that I began to see something different about how we understood human nature and our current system's responses to it. I became increasingly dissatisfied with the current ways of thinking help people find housing, refer to them to treatment, make them hireable, and oh yeah, they should have some social support. But none of these very real needs of people returning home recognize the need for dignity, acknowledgement, and personal agency. Providing people help is essential, but it wasn't enough without showing care, love, and empathy, even from parole officers. The real transformation toward restorative justice for me has come in the last few years. I've had the immense privilege of serving as a volunteer for San Diego's Circles of Support and Accountability, or COSA. COSA is a community-based support group comprised of volunteers who meet with a core member, someone who's returned from prison, typically after a long period of incarceration, for a violent or sexual offense and doesn't have family or friends to return to. COSA is one of the longest running restorative justice programs with research evidence to show that it not only reduces recidivism, but also improves the lives of those involved, including victims. The volunteers surround the core member with support in ways that mirror what it's like to have a tight-knit family or group of friends. Volunteers bring their unique positions and experiences to help the core member reintegrate and in the process focus on accountability to the victim and community 
through healing and restoration. While the focus of the COSA circle is on the core member, I also experienced a transformation. I was able to see and hear and feel and fully internalize what it means to support restoration of humanity to someone who has caused harm. My recent COSA circle centered around our core member who'd spent more than a decade in prison, only to be released to the community two months before COVID isolated him again. Along with my fellow circle volunteers, we navigated the pandemic together, as well as providing guidance on how to re-enroll in college, buy a computer, then a car, apply for jobs, and support reuniting with a family member. We got to plan for the future. Experiencing restorative justice practices firsthand has transformed me into a believer. I tell you all of this because I'm a former worker in the legal system who's transitioned into reforming it. I've been involved in a sort of think tank to help develop these ideas around what restorative reintegration means. While this work is still a work in progress, I can share with you some key ingredients for what can make the reintegration process more restorative based on the rich and very real experiences of community members, researchers, practitioners, and people who've been incarcerated. First, restorative justice holds that everyone is deserving of dignity and humanity. No matter the harm, a core principle of restorative justice is that everyone is worthy. Second, recognize that everyone coming home from prison goes through a reentry process. 95% of people who go to prison will return to their communities. It is critical that we recognize the collective experience of reentry and to it provide a collective response. Third, we must acknowledge a person's past trauma and the trauma of being incarcerated in order to center their humanity and the reintegration process and better understand the nature of their needs and how to respond to them. If community members and criminal justice workers like parole officers, start from this place instead of one where someone might mess up at any moment, we can restore dignity to the reintegration process. Fourth, for reintegration to take place, we assume that people were integrated before they went to prison, that people were previously welcomed and embedded in their home communities. But is that always the case? If not, and I likely suspect it's not, what is the responsibility of the community for supporting integration of its members? Here, restorative reintegration turns the focus to communities and calls upon it to make space for people, not just to return, but to come home. Finally, and importantly, restorative reintegration must emphasize the responsibility of the person who caused harm to reckon with that harm, and as a result, commit to living their life differently than before. This type of accountability and restorative justice reveals a path for making victims whole, rebuilding relationships with communities and restoring one's humanity. The men and women you will hear from today embody these principles. Please help me welcome to the stage, Elta May Douglas Varlack Butler. Throughout my life, I had many reasons to hate. I was only eight years old when I met my first offender. This was a person tasked with caring for me, my babysitter. I struggled with guilt from remaining silent, and I almost suffocated growing up past the walls of hate. Hate for the person who harmed me for years, and hate for myself for feeling like I was forever damaged. I worked hard not to hate, to remain positive. But as soon as I saw a place for myself in the world, hope quickly faded. Because in the eighth grade, I met three more offenders who attempted to rape me. I was coming home from school, waiting in the lobby of my building when they forcibly dragged me 13 flights to the roof. This experience left me feeling hopeless, worthless, and undeserving of love. Naturally, I began to hate those who caused me harm. In fact, I hated all offenders. I didn't believe they could change. However, the hate 
was changing me. I was depressed, filled with rage. I was unable to trust. I was constantly battling with hate. So I get it. I get why it's so difficult to forgive and just justify wanting to lock them up and throw away the key. So imagine how I felt when I received the call that my brother was arrested and incarcerated five hours away. This label of offender had now been placed on him. And if that wasn't enough, after driving five hours, when I finally arrived to the correction facility, I was met with disdain, coldness, by each person, I, by the first person I saw, and then each person after that. There was no compassion from the correctional officers. It was just this harshness of being vilified because of my association to someone whom society has labeled offender. Once again, I had to fight back the feelings of hate that I worked so hard to heal. The dehumanization that I experienced and encountered every time I went to a visit, it tore at my dignity. I felt ostracized. And I was suppressing anger from remembering my brother with chains on his hands. All I felt was pain. I suffered in silence watching my mother shrink back due to the stigma and the shame of having a family member in prison. <sighs> we were being told things like we weren't Christian enough, or maybe we got what we deserved as a family. So there were so many reasons and so many people for me to hate, like the one who caused me harm, and then the ones who got away and the ones who perpetuate systemic harm. Hate blinded me from embracing my true self and from honoring my brother as an extension of that true self. Hate had a chokehold on my life. But as I sat with myself, what I really discovered was I hated me. I felt like a failure I couldn't make every visit so I can remind my brother of his humanity and to show him that I loved him. I hated me. But God, <laughs> but God wouldn't let my heart break. I had to find the courage and dig deep. Otherwise, this hate, it would kill me. So I released myself from the burden of hate, and I chose love. Oh, but not just any love. I'm talking about a restorative love. A restorative love is the sacred way of being that says, as I see you, I see me. And as I see me, I see you. I decided to choose a more excellent way and to see how our perceptions can be healed of how we view one another. So I really embrace this concept of restorative love. How did I do this? I faced myself, I sat with myself, and I chose to love all of me. As I see it, restorative love is a commitment to doing the inner work on ourselves and honoring the power of our voice. Even the voices and the things that try to make us feel shame that causes us not to see our own humanity. Restorative love breaks the cycle of harm towards self, towards vulnerable persons, families, and communities. But when I chose restorative love, I found out how easy it was for society 
to hate and turn a blind eye. We can't make a mistake in society. Love has limits, that has conditions, that if are left unmet, <laughs> will get you canceled. Have we become a society that throws people away? Research shows that 40 million American adults grew up with domestic violence. And children exposed to domestic violence are 74% more likely to grow up and commit a violent crime. So what about the children who are trapped in adult bodies, trying to make sense of the world? These are the men and women that grow up and commit crimes, and we label them. We hate them. Oh, and we lock them up and throw away the key. We are so focused on labeling others that we are not focusing the light on ourselves. Restorative love holds the power to heal humanity. And if we can discover the place and point in our lives where we stop believing in love, we can move from this constant state of self-preservation, engage in self-reflection, and embrace all parts of ourselves, even if it's ugly. And if society would take the time, each person, to connect with what's right in ourselves regardless of our past, then we can connect with what's right in others knowing their history. So if we would stop and slow down and take the time to listen to our hearts, then we can heal the, the belief that the way to heal harm is by causing more harm. So I ask, where was the place where you stopped believing in love? Where was the place where you stopped having faith in humanity? Was it the time when you suffered from a broken heart? Or was it that time when you trusted in someone the most and they betrayed you. Or maybe it was the time you experienced a racial harm. Restorative love reconciles and it reframes the belief that not all are worthy of love, dignity, and respect. It sees offenders as more than that. They are our mothers, our fathers, our sisters, our brothers, and our lovers. The difference with restorative love is that the first person I get to love is me, free from guilt, free from shame, and free from the harsh labels that society placed on me. See, if I would have held on to hate, I would not have been empowered in my healing journey to raise two college graduates one who actually works for the NFL Washington Commanders, and the other one who studied three months in Italy and is now a chef. See, if I would have held on to hate, I would not have been able to believe in myself and go back to school and get a bachelor's in psychology, a master's in social work, and now on a path to earning my PhD. If I had have held on to hate, I would be unfulfilled, unable to connect. I would be single. <laughs> <laughs> and I wouldn't have said yes to my forever love. When we commit to this restorative love, when we commit to this forever work and let go of false ideals and heal historical harms and see the interconnectedness of our humanity, we can cultivate this restorative love that's inclusive. However, it must start with you. And you, you are the catalyst to transforming harm, repairing, transforming trauma actually, <laughs> and repairing harm. And you are the catalyst to healing you. See, 
if you take the time and engage in this restorative love, it will allow you to remember, face you, hold space for whatever surfaces. And it would also allow you to embrace the hidden parts of yourself in a way that brings you soul justice. So I invite you to experience this restorative love. <laughs> you gotta return to the scene. Return to that place where you forgot, where the lights went out. Return to the point in time where you stopped believing in love, where you stopped having faith in humanity and heal that place so you can face yourself Embrace who you are in totality and heal humanity. And I know that you can do this. You know how? Because I am the other you. Thank you. Please help me welcome to the stage DeAndre Brooks. Hey, stop giving away your power. I know you're doing it because I've done so myself many times and I've watched others do it as well. I've watched individuals come home from prison with the best of intentions of living a clean and productive life. And as soon as they face barriers, like not being able to get a job, being labeled a felon, not being able to get housing, and possibly becoming homeless, they go, back right, they go right back to the same things that caused them to go to prison in the first place. It's a vicious cycle, and the boomerang is definitely real. Don't get me wrong, I understand and respect the struggle personally. Bills need to be paid, children need to be cared for, and being viewed and treated as less than, well, that does a number on your psyche. I know. When I first came home, I experienced being denied jobs and opportunities all because of my background. I, I applied for a job at a group home and talked to one of the directors, and they assured me that I would have a good opportunity to get the job. I was excited. After spending 10 years in prison, I hadn't witnessed anybody come home that was able to get a job with a livable wage that they could be proud of. But here I was being presented with just that chance. Before this can happen, the state of California stepped in and they denied the group home the opportunity to be able to sign that letter of exemption and give me that chance that I needed. I was crushed. I began to doubt if the process of reform was even real. Had I been pursuing my education in vain, was I trying to do all the right things for nothing? I wanted to say to hell with this, I'm gonna go back to sell drugs and do whatever it takes in order to just be able to win. But this time, I chose something completely different. I chose to take a pause when this opportunity came to me. All the emotions, all the thoughts, processing everything, I decided to take a moment of silence and just kind of ground myself and say, hey, I don't want to go back. <laughs> this was a pivotal moment in my life, very pivotal moment. From that point forward, I realized whenever I would become emotionally hijacked or really just attacked by life and different things in general, that I needed to take that moment just to pause and respond and let things flow. That opened up doors for me that otherwise wouldn't be possible for individuals like myself that come from the extremes that I come from. As simple as that may sound and seem to just pause and take your time, it's not so easy, not so much so. Even after building that muscle in your mind, it was just saying, let me take a pause and let me take a moment to think, you still just get hit with attacks and different situations that you have to continue to process and work your way through. When that happens, people easily land back in prison because you're reacting to a situation instead of responding to it and taking that time. Even as recently as a couple of months ago, 
I was faced with a situation and I failed. I failed miserably. <laughs> failed miserably. I was at a conservative restaurant here in San Diego on the Bayfront. I had ordered some food and I was dealing with a waiter. I tasted the food and he seen my facial expression and was like, is everything okay? And I was like, nah. <laughs> and he was like, would you like us to go back and recook the food and you know, see if we can get that right for you? I said, no problem. Upon returning with the second plate, he began to talk to me in a slick tone. <laughs> and was like, would you like to take the silverware and the knives with you too? So I sat there, and instead of pausing, and there, and there were many ways I could have dealt with that situation, I decided to react and I matched that energy. I told him, who the hell do you think you're playing with, and I'm not your slave. <laughs> the waiter then reacted by pulling the Karen and calling the police. <laughs> Sad to say I spent that night in jail over something that could have been avoided had I just took my time and not engaged that energy. Although all ended up working itself out, I still put my future in jeopardy. When we react to situations, instead of responding, we defer the power of our choice to whoever it was that came through with that, with those, that, that attacks you, I should say. But had I taken a moment just to respond, instead of reacting, all of that would have changed. When we react and match people's energies, it leaves zero chance for opportunity at de-escalation and being able to take the best course of action. On the contrary, when we respond, we think. We get to choose. We get to have the chance to find the best course of action. I suspect my entire evening and that night would have went different with the waiter had I chose to just respond and instead of reacting to him. Simply put, our emotions drive our reactions. Our logic drives our responses. Victor Frankl, founder of Logotherapy, concentration camp survivor, he said it best. He said, between stimulus and response, there's a space right there in the middle. And that space is our power to choose. What I discovered by listening to that was that between that space, when it comes to reaction and response, there lies our future. Every single opportunity we get to wake up and have a choice and have an option to do different things. I believe everything would have been all right had I responded, and I believe in life, everything is a test. We're always gonna have that chance to be able to respond to the ways that people treat us, to respond to the situations that we are in. Because keep in mind, if you fight fire with fire, you're gonna get more fire. And everything is gonna continue <laughs> just to be fire. <laughs> That's not what we want. Today, I'm no longer a victim of my circumstances like most of the people are where I come from, because when they get faced with situations, they choose to react. And nine times out of 10, those reactions are where land individuals back in prison. And then the cycle continues again, because like I said earlier, the boomerang is real. This time, I've been able to just build that muscle, continue to move forward and learn from my mistakes, and when you learn from your mistakes, you put yourself in a situation to where you're able to consistently keep jobs like I have. You're able to receive your associate's, bachelor's, and master's degree. My greatest accomplishment is my son right here in front of us. DJ, <laughs> DJ, that's everything to me. That's everything to me. Um, my father asked the other day, this is a little off topic, but this means a lot to me right here, right? My father asked, or he called me the other day and told me, you know what I asked your son? Who he wants to be when he grows up, or what he wants to be, and he said his dad. And just everything that I've been through, that touched me, that touched me. But that's why I said that's my greatest accomplishment right there. I've also been able to speak to local governments, uh, elected officials. I've been to the California State Assembly to testify many times to the Public Safety Committee and all of those accomplishments, anybody can have that opportunity, especially coming from the backgrounds that we come from. 
they're available to everybody. All you have to do is just understand the power in responding versus reacting and take that space and know that that's where your future is created. Thank you. Please help me welcome to the stage, Jason Samuel. When you hear the word gang, what comes to mind? When you hear the word gang, you must have think of Crips, Bloods, Northerners, Southerners. But if you ever question the police as a gang, Webster Dictionary defined the word gang as a number of people joined together in order to intimidate someone. After hearing that definition, I ask you again, do you view the police as a gang? I think most people see police as being supportive to come to their rescue when you call them. While in grade school, police would come to assemblies and classes saying just say no to drugs. And when you call them, when you see crime. These sound like supportive things to me but my reality was different. As a child, I only saw the police arrest people. At the age of 10, I was forcibly taken from the police when I was being removed from my mother's custody. At 13, I was at a party when the police raided with a dog and a little girl was injured. At the age of 14, I was taken to custody for shooting and I wasn't even there. To me, I didn't feel like I was being supported. And the statistics didn't help my views either. By one estimate, black men are two times more likely in their lifetime to be killed by the police. In another study, since 2015, police have fatally shot and killed 135 unarmed black men and women nationwide. And at least 75% of the police was white. I had enough evidence. To me, the police were very much a gang, a rival gang. We were two enemies trying to intimidate one another. And when you're in a rival gang, it's kill to be killed. One day, I was sleeping in the passenger side of my white Ford Pinto. With my gun in my pocket, for safekeeping in the neighborhood where there's only gangs and violence. I was awakened by a knock on the window. There's two officers asking me to step out the car. In my mind, I knew I was going to die. This was the feeling I had that night. As I stepped out the car to get searched, the officer patted my pocket down, and he yelled, gun! I ran, jumped the fence. The officer close behind chased me, backed me into a corner, feared for my life. I shot him. At first, I was proud. I thought about something good. We were rival gangs. Wasn't that what we were supposed to do? The homie said, we should kill to be killed. We should kill the police. But when I did, I wasn't honored nor praised. Instead, they distanced themselves from me. Asked me why. Why'd you do it? I was arrested at, on April 13, 1997, and charged with shooting Officer Tom Morgan. The officer lived, and I went to prison at 17 years old, faced with a life sentence. The truth of what I had done there settled in. I was confused. My whole belief system destroyed. I had a life sentence in front of me, and I was devastated. I didn't want to die in prison. And ultimately, not to die there, I had to become a better person. I had to figure out a way to learn compassion and understanding. All these emotions I didn't have for people. So I went to groups in prison. I saw I had to deal with my own issues, my mother issues, my daddy issues. And to be willing to forgive those that I felt don't be wrong in the past. And once I got through that, it was easy for me. Including, it was easy for me to start forgiving, including Tom, the rival gang member, the police. Forgiveness became a process of taking the weight off. It released all my pressures. I have been feeling my whole life the shame, the guilt, the feeling of betrayal. 
But once I started forgiving myself, I started loving me. When I started loving me, I discovered I didn't need anyone else to, else, else to love me. Loving me was enough. It's very hard when, you admit, when you're doing something wrong. It takes a certain amount of pride. And most people don't do that. Hey, I grew up not admitting when I was wrong. I thought it was shameful. But now, I'm a man. And I wanted to admit when I was wrong. And I wanted to apologize to Tom, whether he forgave me or not. Because this forgiveness was for me. And in this apology, a credible thing happened. When I admitted I was wrong, Tom admitted it too. I didn't know him and he didn't know me. But as soon as he heard my backstory and I heard his, we had compassion for one another. He saw value in me instead of someone to try to take his life. We saw one another as humans. I respected him and he respected me. I now have the support of both he and his wife, Christy. We formed a strong bond and we shared life experiences. We even speak together at groups of students and parents and professionals so our story can make a difference in others' lives. I had to understand that Tom was a man. He had a family like me. He had a mom, he had a dad. Without the clothes, without the badge, he was just a person. I had to see that first. It was said that violence is one of the most cohesive building components of gangs. I want us to drop our guns and use a more powerful weapon of change, communication and forgiveness. Let's get to know one another as humans. What would it look like if the police actually got to know the community and the people in it? Once you know a person who they is, is it, it ain't even easy to pull the trigger or sit in a jail, prison, if you know, especially if you know this person's values and the morals that they hold. If I knew Tom and Tom knew me, what does that happen? What if we retrain the police in de-escalation? How is communities look then? If we provide after-school programs where they have kids that are not on the street after school, where they have a safe place to be? These kind of changes can be hard because it comes with uncertainty. It could mean changing laws, police losing jobs, or even funding. Because of the unknown, most people are not ready for change. But change will come when you are being honest and accountable and willing to forgive. This will promote growth, compassion, and understanding. Hey, if two individuals from rival gangs can come together and share compassion and understanding, I believe we all will if we can all see one another's humanity. Thank you. Please help me welcome to the screen, Rena Alspa. Desmond Tutu, anti-apartheid and human rights activist, was quoted as saying, hope is being able to see that there is light despite all of the darkness. I recall a time when I questioned whether that light really existed. Have you ever been there? I grew up in an abusive home where I learned that the only acceptable emotion was anger and that violence was an appropriate response to it. Between the ages of six and 14, I was anonymously referred to Child Protective Services nine times. They wouldn't intervene until I was 14. And then I was placed in a foster home that pretty much mirrored my childhood with alcoholism, anger, and violence. I wanted something different, but without any examples in my life, I didn't know how to do anything different. So I repeated the same things I witnessed and experienced in my childhood, and I responded to the world with violence. By the time I was 16, I was living on my own. For the most part, I led a rather isolated life. This left me vulnerable for abuse 
and recreating the environment I grew up in. This is how I came to engage in an abusive relationship with Sean, who was 21 years old. Without the necessary life experience or tools to escape this relationship or get help, I responded with violence, taking Sean's life. I am what the justice system refers to as a juvenile lifer. Committing this horrible crime at the age of 16, I was charged as an adult and sentenced to 30 years to life in prison. Every day that I was there, someone, whether an inmate, an officer, or other staff member, would tell me that I was never getting out and that I would die in prison. I couldn't believe that. And I lived convinced that one day I would be free. I never imagined it would be 21 years before I walked out of there. Can you guess the first question people ask me about being incarcerated? They ask, how did you get through 21 years in prison? The answer is really quite simple. Hope. Of course, for me, hope is a God thing and directly relates to my spirituality. That might seem odd to some of you and certainly too simple. Yet, I believe in hope. Hope changed me and allowed me to understand that I was not a magnet for bad things in life or bad luck, and that I had the power to choose how I responded to the world around me. I'm not talking about hope in the way we see hope in society today. You see, people have become desensitized to the power of words like hope. People hope to win the lottery. They hope for good weather on the weekends. They definitely hope for good traffic on the way home. Small, inconsequential things that definitely impact our daily lives. However, this is not real hope. I am talking about a profound, powerful, mountain-moving hope. This is what I believe in. What has taken place in society is that we've spent much of our life hoping for these little mundane things things that certainly bring a little joy and comfort, that we become afraid to hope for the big things in life, the real things. We are suddenly afraid to use hope or rely on hope for the serious things, like cancer, life sentences, the loss of a loved one. We convinced ourselves that we've already spent the hope that we have on traffic and good weather, as if there is a limit to God-given hope. If people understood the true power of hope and what hope could bring to their lives, they would overcome fears, they would reduce stress, and they could conquer those feelings of hopelessness and helplessness when the big things come their way. Believe me, those big things are coming. Whether you experience it directly or through a loved one, Life brings difficulty. Jesus said it only takes a mustard seed size faith to move into that mountain moving hope. It is not just a word, but action, a belief, a lifestyle even. Every day throughout my incarceration, I was told to look around and get used to what I saw because it was the last thing I would ever see. But I refused to accept that dying in prison would be my reality. It was my hope that sustained me in more ways than I can express. Has anyone seen the movie, The Shawshank Redemption? It's one of my favorite films, and not only because it tells the story of lifers. Particularly the scene where Andy and Red are talking on the yard and Andy says to Red, hope is a good thing, maybe even the best of things, and no good thing ever dies. Only in hindsight would I know and understand the life-saving power of those words. By the way, 
prison really is as dark and horrible as depicted in that film. Rife with abuse and violence, sprinkled with a few moments of joy. So how did I maintain hope throughout those 21 years? My hope remained steadfast because of a seed that was planted by an angel the night of my arrest. Does anyone here believe in angels? After my arrest and admission prior to housing me, the receiving staff said that I would have to speak to the officer of the day. I recall her leading me into this office where an older white man with gray hair was sitting across the desk. The nameplate said Mr. Wilson. And in my mind, I could not help but imagining the old comic Dennis the Menace hollering, Mr. Wilson. For those of you who just went to Castaway with Tom Hanks, it wouldn't be released for another six years. Mr. Wilson looked at me with sad eyes and expressed regret that I was there at all. And then he proceeded to tell me how the following days would unfold and that I would not be released in the next couple of months or years. The most important thing he said to me was that no matter what anyone else said, for me to know that I would be released one day, that they could not keep me forever. About 18 months later, I was working and receiving for the same staff member who had admitted me. I found myself thinking about Mr. Wilson and how everything he had told me had transpired exactly the way he said it would. I asked the staff member about him, but she insisted she had no idea who I was talking about. I reminded her of the night I was admitted and even took her to the office where I met Mr. Wilson. She acknowledged that I would have had to see the officer of the day, but there was never a Mr. Wilson who had worked there. Although I didn't know it at the time, how the hope planted by Mr. Wilson that day would transform my life, I understand today that hope is what fueled my perseverance, resilience, and tenacity, allowing the years that I spent in prison to change the way I responded to the world forever. Since my release, I have been able to travel to Costa Rica for a study abroad program while still on parole I transferred to San Diego State University and completed my undergraduate degree in social work with an emphasis in community corrections case management. I received a full scholarship for a master's in restorative justice at Santa Clara University. I have become certified in victim offender dialogues and restorative practices. And I have been able to return to the women's prisons in California as a guest speaker and a visitor. Hope can lead you to similar success. I know it is not an easy transformation and that mainstream media seeks to rob us of hope. I mean, who can watch the news or read about social media bullying, school shootings or hate crimes and feel joyful or safe and still believe there's good in the world? With hope, joy, safety and good not only remain possible, but become probable. Whether an angel in your life, a stranger, or a loved one, hope can come from anywhere. It is ultimately a choice. Today, I choose hope. And with that hope, I choose life. Thank you. Please help me welcome to the stage, Richard Sandoval. For many years of my life, I've always been in pursuit of happiness. I was addicted to feeling good, but I never knew how to achieve that or what that even felt like. I would always take my cues from other people, like when a friend had something cool, I would see the twinkle in their eyes and the smile on their face. And I would always tell myself I had to have that. But it was as if 
I felt their excitement, but what I felt was adrenaline, and that adrenaline felt good. And every time, every time, single time I told myself, I had to have it. And I was always willing to do whatever it took to achieve that. It didn't matter if I had to do something illegal or if I had to steal it from a friend. But once I obtained it, it was no big deal. It'd be like a dirty shoe. I would just kick it aside and move on to something else. I also tried to find happiness within alcohol. I would drink as fast as I could and on an empty stomach when I was with my friends. Another avenue I chose was going down the rough road of addiction. In the beginning, in my early years, I was in the minor leagues of doing cat hash and smoking weed. And then in my 20s, I graduated into the major leagues of cocaine and crystal meth. I didn't like myself. I didn't even love myself. And I always felt I was not good enough of a person for anyone else to like. This pain became like a cancer growing inside of me, eating away at my inner self and destroying me. The mental anguish was sometimes too intense to bear, and I only had myself to shoulder the pain. This led to a life of addiction, of violence, and a crime that landed me in prison for 27 years of a 54-year sentence. So where did this pain and this emptiness start? For me, I can trace it back to a time in my life in the fourth grade. My teacher, Sister Mercedes. You see, I have a learning disability, and it made reading hard for me. Sister Mercedes would stand me in front of the class and have me face the other students. She would read something from a textbook, and then she would tell them what my answer was. And she would tell the whole class that I was dumb and stupid for the whole year. This happened repeatedly. To some, Sister Mercedes was a saint. But to me, she became the devil of my nightmares. And I never asked a teacher for help again. And year after year, they would just keep passing me from one grade to another. The first time I ever read a book and re could retain what I read, I was 21 years old, and I was in the California Youth Authority. It was a Louis L'Amour book. Sister Mercedes is where I can recall the pain beginning. And that pain kept escalating. I didn't love myself. I didn't like myself. And because of this, I didn't respect other people, their property, or their rights. This led to the revolving door of in and out of prison. There were a series of events that happened to me while I was incarcerated that led to me attending a Christian retreat called Kairos in 2003. It was as if God picked me up and moved me to where his love was at. Once I went on that retreat, everything changed. I started liking myself, loving myself, and I started valuing other people and caring about them. My pain gave me strength, but it also showed me that I had to release my pain and let go of my hurtful past. Letting go of my past made me stronger, and God is who brought me to that happiness. I'm sure we all have had this pain inside of us. Release your pain and find your happiness from within. Now, you don't have to live a life of crime, serve time in prison, or be a drug addict like I once was in my past life. How many people in our society are in constant pursuit of happiness? How many people are struggling in relationships or mental health or feeling alone and numb and looking in whatever way they can to fill that emptiness? The fact that I am standing here tells my story is proof that people can change. I believe God can change anybody. I believe that rehabilitation can take place, but a person first must have that desire to want to change. Without that desire, change can't take place. After I started to accept God into my life, I started to develop 
a new mindset. I started realizing that I didn't want to victimize anybody and hurt anyone anymore. They say beauty is in the eye of the beholder. I say happiness is in the eye of the beholder. What makes me feel happy may not make somebody else feel happy. And what makes someone else feel happy may not make me feel happy. When I was looking for things to make me happy outside of myself, looking for those adrenaline hits, I ended up hurting other people. But when I found my light from within, I found my freedom. My freedom released me from all that pain, hurt, shame, and sadness, and everything else that stunted my mental and professional growth. I believe in the saying, positive mindset, positive life. Life is not perfect, but for me, I am perfectly happy with the choices I made in coming to God. I now have my freedom, and nothing is holding me back. Since then, I was released from prison August of 2019. I was discharged off parole September of 2021. My prison number was 36 years old. The last time I did drugs was June 5th, 1992. And last year, I drank six and a half beers. I live an honest life. I'm a Eucharistic minister at my church, and I'm involved with Crisil, a group within the Catholic Church who share a similarity to Cairo's inside prison. What's holding you back from finding your light and gaining your freedom? I remember being on my knees praying to God that one day I would be free and I could go to church with my parents. And he brought me that freedom. Just a couple weeks ago, I found myself accepting communion at my church with tears in my eye because I knew that today I am free and my prayers have come true. I am not just free from the walls of prison, but I am also free from the walls of my mind. God gave me my freedom. And, just, and I'm not just what Sister Mercedes said in the fourth grade. God gave me my freedom. Maybe he could give you yours. God was patiently waiting for me to come to him with a full heart. And I know that he is waiting for you too. Thank you. Please help me welcome to the stage our final speaker of the afternoon, Daryl Varlack Butler. Have you ever wished you lived another life? Have you ever wished you lived another life? How dark has your darkest night ever been? A day? A week? Longer? Was it from a loss? The death of someone you loved? Was it from depression? Mental illness? Was it from something you did or something that happened to you? Have you ever li wished you lived another life? If you have, you're not alone because I have too. From slavery to mass incarceration, people of color have been convicted in the womb, placed in situations, circumstances where crime generative factors influence their behaviors. There are over 20 million people in prison in the United States today. They made the worst decisions of their lives in situations of despair hopelessness, and I am one of these human beings. My birth to an immigrant mother was premature. At four, I experienced my first harm. At seven, I saw my first death, not in a funeral home, but on the stairway of my building. I lived in the projects, and my friend came to get me to go outside and play. On our way downstairs, we found his brother dead with a needle in his arm, 
something I never forgot. The same way I never forgot that we never played together again either. About a year later, a friend came to see me to go out inside and play. And when I stepped outside into the hallway, his older brother was there goading him to do it. And he unleashed punches on me that I was not able to respond to, much less to defend. Poverty, danger, and violence were all around me. Because of the trauma I was experiencing at eight, I couldn't keep still. So in school, they locked me in a classroom. At 10, it was broad daylight when an addict stuck a knife to my neck and robbed me. There were adults there. They just watched. No one did anything. Poverty, danger, and violence were all around me. My exposure experiences of harm growing up was normal and natural. You see, being light-skinned with hazel eyes from an urban environment, they called you soft. You was a pretty boy. You were targeted and suspect for violence. At 18, my father was killed by trying to stop someone else from being murdered. It was at then I told myself, the next time someone hurt me, I would kill him. No more black eyes, no more scars, no more suffering harm, because violence wasn't instinctive to me. I decided to get down and stop lying down. That was the worst, the worst decision I made because I would not have become something I never envisioned for myself, a murderer. I took the life of another lost, misguided young male of color that hit me in the head with a baseball bat. In my heart, I knew I was wrong and ashamed. I realized later that I had suffered from a mental breakdown, from all of the harm and rage that was boiling inside of me, from all of the years that I experienced it. You see, this is how social and racial injustice impacts people of color in a daily way. The poverty, violence, drugs, and despair are like a thousand little tiny cuts into the psyche, leaving you feeling worthless hopeless, and on a downward spiral. We are made up of so much more good than bad. I believe more good. And I'm thankful that my parents reminded me that I was better than the worst act that I committed. My parents were my way makers. What I did broke my pop's heart, my Joseph because he swore to protect me and make sure the system didn't get me, and it got me. But he still came to see me, and he left me cigarettes and put money on my books so that I'd be able to get the things that I needed to survive while in there. My pop made way despite his own shame, his own broken heart. My mother, she made way too. She was strong, she was proud. She had seen me struggle, witnessed the scars and bruises and saw me keep getting up and keep moving on. When my mother came to see me and she saw me in that cage, she was angry. My mother put money in my books and left me books. She wanted me to learn, to grow, to heal and to become socially conscious as a male of color in a racially charged world. Together, my parents modeled strength, hope, the power of possibility for a new day. They gave me strength when I was weak. They gave me hope when I was hopeless. And they never let me forget that it wasn't over every time we spoke. My mother provided me with lifelong changing books and literature to expand my mind my world, and ultimately find myself in it. One of the books she brought me was My Ray of Light. It had brothers and sisters on the cover and dashikis with afros. 
They were in the greenest grass I had ever saw. They had something that I yearned for, I ached for, as I sat in that cold cage of steel. I picked it up and I read that book over and over and over from cover to cover. It was entitled Soul Food. Food for your soul. It turned out to be the New Testament. It was then that I let Jesus take the wheel. This was my born again experience. With the tears pouring down my face from guilt and shame and confessing my sins, God gave me newfound wisdom that was both purging and purifying. A spirit, a new breath of life entered me. A connection to God and his redeeming love changed everything. God saved me, God forgave me, and gave me new life as I had thirst for it. Jesus made way. Thankfully, there were other men who made way for me. First, I must acknowledge the men that also wore green inside these prisons right there with me. They educated me. They inspired me. And they helped me to grow from the boy that entered that prison into a man. There were prison administrators and staff who treated me like a human being and did not judge me for being there and stated that. There were counselors that told me about rehabilitative programs in different prisons, and they helped me get there. There was the Society of Friends, the Quakers. They befriended me. They wrote me. They visited me. When I was younger, my older sisters, they were brilliant. They went through school with a breeze. Me, I just barely graduated. But when in prison, I went back to school, I had a math teacher that I met named Daryl. I took his classes from remedial to pre-calculus, and I received all A's. He helped me get back a part of myself that I kind of never had, self-esteem and confidence. It was learning and reading that helped me escape the apathy and death of prison. It liberated my mind. Here are a few books. I shed tears with George and Jonathan Jackson through blood in my eye. A part of my heart died at wounded knee. Yes, I was a black boy, a native son, an outsider. How could I not see why the black bird cried? Oops, the caged bird sings. Humbly, I was a miseducated Negro, realizing that there was a conspiracy to counter in destroying black boys. I was the face looking up from the bottom of the well. And can I tell you something close to my heart? Every time my mother sent me a, a care package, she fed me chicken soup for my soul. Countless ancestors in their writings gave me life for the first time. I found a reason and a purpose for living. Who made way for you when everyone else gave up on you? Who saw the best in you when others could only see the worst in you? Who opened doors for you to go through? Thanks to the unshakable love and sacrifices of those who made way for me, I walked out of prison 25 years later with an unbreakable faith, an associate's degree, a bachelor's degree, and a master's. My divinity and humanity helped me to grow from being a con, a prisoner, a inmate to a person in prison. And it also helped me to see the other, the hat, the guards, and the correction officers as people too. I don't know how it happened, but one day I looked up and all I saw was people in a situation and people with occupations. My restorative transformation and reentry happened because of waymakers. We all need someone to believe in us and exercise their power and their privilege and gifts to make way for us. Be a waymaker by advocating 
for higher education, therapeutic programs, and family support reunification. Studies have shown that people who gain higher education and maintain close ties with their families in prison have a lower recidivism rate. Consider sponsoring a bus trip to help families visit their loved ones. Create a support group for families who support their loved one in prison. Families need to know that you care about them too. Volunteer to help people in your community obtain access and resources they need to improve themselves in their lives. I wish you become a way maker. There's nothing more powerful than the will to survive other than someone showing up with compassion and conviction to help someone find their way. Will you embrace a brother or sister that is in prison by writing them, communicating with them, and letting them know that you care? Will you embrace a brother or sister, a human being, when they are released? Help them obtain a job. Help them find housing. Help them get a fresh start. This is what a restorative reentry looks like. It starts for a person in prison and continues when they are out. This is what my made my reentry successful. Someone cared and exercised their power, their privilege to help me find my way. When community members come alive, miracles do happen. I was asked what I wanted to do now that I was out. I shared that my mother was a social worker and that I wanted to get my master's in social work too. Not only did I get my master's in social work, but I was chosen in 2015 to give my class benediction. I went from Attica prison, the worst hell you can imagine, to standing on stage at one of the most prestigious universities in the country, Fordham University, giving the benediction. I was able to accomplish this and other successes in my life because people made way. They saw me as human. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. once said, when evil men plot, good men must plan. When evil men bomb and burn, good men must build and bind. When evil men shout ugly words of hatred, good men must commit themselves to the glories of love. Where evil would seek to perpetuate an unjust status quo, Good men must bring into being a real order of justice. This is your challenge to being a good human being. Add your good to the world and exercise your power, your privilege. There's someone that needs you. Please, be a way maker. Thank you. So I was in prison for 31 months in a federal prison, relatively short period of time uh, compared to our heroes that you just heard from. And uh, while I was still in a halfway house uh, down in San Diego off of Boston Street, uh, I had permission to go back to church. I'm a Catholic. I work for the Catholic Church, as you know. Um, and I went into my parish. We have a couple of our Sacred Heart parishioners here today. Richard, one of our speakers, is a Sacred Heart parishioner. And I went up to receive the Holy Eucharist. We as Catholics believe that that's the living presence of Jesus Christ. And I walked up there with a lot of shame, thinking that everybody was looking at me. Uh, I was pretty active in the parish before that. And uh, go up to receive the Eucharist. And as I walked up, my pastor was saying Mass that Sunday, Father Mike Murphy. And uh, as I got ready to receive the body of Christ, my pastor, in persona Christi, the person of Christ, my priest, put his arms around me, drew him closely to me, and said, welcome home, I love you. And that's what he said to me. And I think what I got, and I think what we all got today, was love. And the message going forward is to love each other. 2,000 years ago, right, Fred? 2,000 years ago, God perfected love for us when he gave his son 
to us for a short period of time, and then through his passion, death, and resurrection, he perfected that for us. And he modeled love for us by giving his only son and giving his love to us. And the stories that we've heard today and the harm early in the lives, I believe, was because there was an absence of love. So going forward, we're going to make a wonderful video production here that we're going to hopefully share, we will share with everyone. We ask you, I know your heart has been deeply moved, as mine has, and hopefully your mind is already open, but that we go forth and provide opportunities for other folks to have a change of heart, to recognize that we as a community on this planet, we're all in it together, none of us are getting out of alive, and while we're here, we have to commit ourselves to love one another. Simply put, love one another, love each other, and shine forth that, that light of love that God perfected for us. Thank you. Thank you so much.